All right, so I think that we are set. We've got uh, everybody in. So welcome everyone to One Schoolhouse. And let's see, a couple of things going on just to get out of the way of interest. Uh, both Peter and I have folks doing sort of extensive noisy yard work nearby. There are trees coming down in my neighborhood. And, and so we're gonna do some muting back and forth as we go, but I wanna welcome everybody here. Again, I'm Sarah Hanewald, Assistant Head of School for Professional Development and New Programs here at One Schoolhouse. And I'm joined by my colleague, Peter Gao. Peter, you wanna say hello before I introduce our guest? Hi, with a, with a chipper going on in the background here. Uh, welcome everyone and so excited to have you here today uh, to talk about this incredibly interesting project that we're going to be hearing more about from Pete and Annette. So Pete. Great. All right. So Pete, I just want to welcome you and I'm going to let everybody know that today we are going to use our um, chat for sharing resources and connecting with other participants. And we're going to use the Q&A for questions for Pete. And I have a feeling that we'll have a lot. So I'll manage those as we go along. But Pete, you are um, you wear a lot of hats at the Blue Ridge School. So would you like to just take a minute and introduce yourself to everyone as we begin? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah. I watch a lot of these um, on the other side. So it's kind of funny to be on this side of it this Wednesday. Um, I'm Pete Bonds. I'm Dean of Faculty and Academics at Blue Ridge School in Central Virginia. Uh, we are an all boys, all boarding college prep school for 180 students in grades. Uh, we are located um, about 30 minutes from Charlottesville and right at the base of the Shenandoah National Park. So a really beautiful place to, to live and work. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so your school is doing something pretty different this year. And when you shared that with me, I think I fired off within seconds. Hey, can you come online and do a webinar with us? And I was really glad when you said yes. So we're excited to hear about this. Um, so normally, I think Peter was going to ask you this, but what oh. happens this time of year? <laughs> yeah, sure. So, so normally um, in a normal school year, this is a really fun time of the year. We would have just started our winter trimester. Students would have just come back from Thanksgiving break. We only have three weeks before the winter break. So this is a fun time, low stress, teachers plan some really fun, hands-on, interesting units for this three-week time. All the Christmas decorations go up. It's, it's one of my favorite times of the year here at Blue Ridge. Students would be attending all six of their classes in person normally. Um, and we'd be leaving in just a few weeks for winter break. Um, pretty different this year. All right, so tell us about the next six weeks. What's gonna happen? Sure, so um, we, as part of our COVID mitigation strategy for this year, realized that to have our, our normal school year um, to accomplish all of the learning goals we have, distance learning to be a part of that. For us as a boarding school, the, the big challenge is getting all of our students here and then making sure that no one has the coronavirus. And so to then send them off and bring them back multiple times is a huge, huge endeavor, a huge challenge. One that we did in August and we pulled off well, but super labor intensive and one that we weren't going to do uh, just for a very short three week period, Thanksgiving and Christmas. So um, over the summer, we decided that we would implement six weeks of distance learning for the school year. Um, and like so many schools, you know, last spring we did, I guess what we're calling emergency distance learning now, right? Where in March we realized we were going to have to move all of our instruction online. Uh, we knew that this year the distance learning would need to look a little bit different. We took a lot of the feedback and um, considerations and our experiences from the spring in order to create something new. This time we had some, some actual planning time to say what could and what should distance learning look like for the six weeks where we can plan. And what we came up with um, was a system that incorporates both synchronous and asynchronous teaching and learning. So 
For the next six weeks, every single school day, our students will be taking um, two classes live synchronously every day. They will be working on two classes asynchronously every week. Um, and two of their classes, uh, that's time for teacher planning, for teacher preparation for those weeks. So we what we liked, which was having live instruction, but incorporated asynchronous instruction which had not been part of our plan at all um, during our spring emergency period of distance learning. Rotation works by department. So we're on this, we're in week one of our six weeks of distance learning. Um, and so today, for example, ending their science classes, they went to a science class this morning, they met with their teacher, they met with all their classmates on Zoom. Uh, this afternoon, all of our students will go to their history class, and at some point they'll meet with their history teacher and uh, the other students in their history class. Um, and they also have for their English course, which is asynchronous this week, and for their elective course, which is asynchronous this week. Um, and then their math course and their world language course are off this week. They don't have work they need to complete for those courses this week. And those teachers are engaged in planning and preparation for um, their distance learning. And so each department cycles through that over three weeks. One week of one week of asynchronous teaching, one week of planning. So <laughs> you talked a little bit at the beginning about some of the, the drivers behind this. But th this was a lot of moving parts and a lot of uh, you know different functions of the school to try to coordinate. Uh, everybody gets something out of it. Everybody has to make some sacrifices. Can you talk a little bit about how the decision um, got made? What the process was? Yeah, so, absolutely, absolutely. I, the the main driver for this was our experience in the spring. Uh, feedback from, we surveyed parents, we surveyed students, we surveyed our teachers. Uh, we looked at what a lot of other did. Um, and we based a lot of what we wanted to do this year on those. And our distance learning, emergency distance learning plan was a little bit different, I think, um, based on data I've seen from, from one schoolhouse actually in that we chose to go last spring entirely synchronous, right? Like all day, every day on Zoom uh, from late March until early. And in some ways that worked well, that had benefits. Um, but the main piece that, that I got from students and parents, and it was my, my own experience too, was that being synchronous on Zoom all day is like profoundly exhausting and, and just <laughs> you know not sustainable. Um, and so I knew that we, we that, that was the key thing to address. And from the, I, I would say, um, I'll see about this, the number one factor, sort of truth or the main idea that drove the development of this plan is um, a realization I had after looking at all of this feedback, which is that, you know, the attention span, the effort, the engagement you're going to get from a student during a period of distance learning is a limited resource. It's a limited commodity. You don't have an like attention span or willingness to engage with distance learning, whether that's over the course of a day or a week or a month or, or a school year. So you have to be really intentional about how do you want to allocate that limited resource? Um, because you could you know, make a program where you just load everything of stuff going on, but that's no good because you've got a limited resource effort and engagement from students. And that's also true for faculty, right? Faculty's willingness and ability to teach online is a limited valuable resource. And we have to think about how we want to allocate that. So ultimately the decision we made conceiving of those as limited resources rather than expend that resource over six synchronous Every day, which has you know a few positives, but some significant drawbacks too. What if we allocated that, that resource differently and said, you know, let's spend it on two synchronous classes every day, two asynchronous classes every week, um, and really make that the focus rather than having to, to balance or juggle six of their classes. Same thing for the teacher, balance all the classes every week it was too much. If we're thinking about having some really meaningful learning outcomes, 
we have to put, you know, the things in place that are going to allow those to happen. And exhausted students, you know, disinterested students, bored students, as everyone on this call knows, are not going to be the best learners. Pete, I just want to jump in and say that you've just framed something, I think, in a way that's really important. We all talk, and we've been talking since March, about the limited resource that is time in schools. But I think thinking about both student engagement um, stu and, and, and faculty engagement energy as being a resource that is perhaps even more limited than time in a lot of ways is a really, really important way for us all to think about this going forward. And I just want to thank you for that. So I think Sarah had a question. That is, yeah, no, that is such a good point, Peter. And I think that framework is essential. And um, if I, I have an extended metaphor I like to use about not um, just loading the driver up with energy drinks and saying, keep on going down the road, you know, you need a navigation system. And maybe you even need a co-driver if you're going far enough. Um, so Pete, I'm just imagining the conversations on campus as you started really thinking about this idea of, okay, we're gonna give each department a full week in December and a full week in January for professional time. Who had to be involved in those conversations? Were there resources that you needed to gather? How did that go? I think the, um, the reception to that idea was, was overwhelmingly positive uh, this, this planning week because when you, when you really think about it, I think we're so good at talking about, um, especially during this time of COVID about these are unprecedented times. People are being to asked to go above and beyond and do things differently. And there's so much uncertainty in the world and that's all very true. And so if you're gonna to respond to any of that, if you're gonna to respond to this uncertainty, if you're gonna to respond to the changes in the teaching landscape and you're going to do it in a meaningful way, you have to give people the time to figure that out. Um, like this is, this is challenging stuff, especially for, for our teachers where teaching like, like synchronous and asynchronous were not words that were really in our vocabulary uh, like 10 months ago. Um, and so to figure all of this out and to do it well requires a lot of time. And so that planning week uh, makes a big difference. It's time for uh, departments that are required to have a, a department meeting where they reflect and talk about how distance learning and their planning is going. Um, it's a time for sort of on-demand professional development. It's a time for observing colleagues in other departments, observing how they teach synchronously. And we use Google Classroom as our LMS. So being invited to your colleagues' classrooms and seeing how they've set things up. We have a number of faculty working on um, advanced degrees. It's a good time for them to do, to, to catch up on that because surely they've been so busy in the fall that that's not become, um, you know, they haven't been able to give that all the time they probably wanted to. And frankly, you know, if, if during their planning week, some of my teachers say, I'm going to take one or two days off and I'm gonna pursue you know, my own passion projects or I'm gonna spend time with my family that I didn't spend in the fall. I think that's fantastic. I think that's great. And at the end of the day, I think it's our students who, who really um, benefit from that. Especially here where in the fall being a boarding school, you know, having to enforce all the protocols that went along with COVID-19, uh, keeping different groups of students separate. We all did a lot of extra duty and had a lot of extra responsibilities in the fall. So giving faculty back some of that time, I think is, is really important. And again, will only benefit our students. I would say that's, that's what I worried a little bit about um, in, in pitching this proposal to you know, my own boss, my own school administration, uh, to our parents. I worried if they might say, well, what do you mean? They just, one of the classes isn't, isn't meeting this week. You know, I pay for six classes, so shouldn't all six classes meet? Um, and I think the, the way we addressed that was going back to that fundamental idea that drove so much of this plan, which is that it's not that we're, we're doing, we're not doing less. We haven't reduced anything. You know, instructional time is the same. Learning goals are more or less the same. Students will spend the same amount of time in class. All we've done is changed the way that we are delivering it. Um, and the format and the rotation so that hopefully it's more effective and engaging and, and takes into consideration that student time and attention and teacher focus and attention are not resources that exist in an unlimited amount. 
I think there's a question in the Q&A that I'm gonna work in now because I think it's really relevant to what you just said. And so we've got the question about how did you arrive at doing this by rotating weeks versus rotating by days? And I used to work at a school and I'm gonna say the schedule was brilliant because I didn't come up with it, someone else did. <laughs> um, I, when I arrived there, it had already been baked, but this was a school that had what they called drop days where just what you're doing over the course of a week the departments did every 10 days, each department had a drop day. And that was how students got their study hall. So rather than having a free period built into their schedule, their period would move around and rotate just like their other schedules would. And I think one of the differences that you're describing and that we saw is that when you have one period as office hours, it's when you meet with students, it's where you do things. But that long concentrated body of work, I'm writing a paper for graduate school that my school supports me attending, or I'm gonna build out an entire unit that needs to be delivered online this year rather than in person. And I'm gonna build asynchronous tools. Long concentrated work is not built into most teachers' professional days. And that is, I think, an ongoing tragedy. The, the current time is making that really visible, but it's been a problem for a lot longer than that. So Pete, when you guys were having your conversations, what made you think, okay, we're gonna do it via a week versus a day? Yeah, I think, so, like, like you said, a week is just a meaningful unit of time. You know, or, hey, really give some deep thought and reflection to how you're going to plan, you know, you can't, you can't do that in a day, you know, that, that, that takes some serious time. And so I felt like a, a week was the, was the right amount of time uh, to allow for planning, but also the right amount of time to allow for our other activities too. I think asynchronously, just doing one day asynchronously, we looked at that too. Should we do like A day, B day kind of thing, you know, every other day, uh, but we decided that that just wouldn't give us sort of the substantial learning that we wanted. I think especially as a result of, you know, our participation in, in the one schoolhouse, summer professional development, we saw that if you kind of set substantial significant learning goals to achieve those and demonstrate your mastery of those learning goals, you know, that's not, you're not going to do that meaningfully over the course of one day. So you might need a week of asynchronous time to do that. And same thing for the synchronous, you know, for us, it was so important that our students see, you know, classmates and teachers in some capacity every single day. So there is live FaceTime interaction every single day in our plan. And a week is a good amount of time because that's when we can really replicate some of what we might do in a physical classroom. Um, you know, those discussions, those, those presentations, some guided uh, interactive lecture, you know, we, we needed a place for that. And a week out of three seemed like a good amount um, as opposed to last spring when that was just all we had all day, every day. The, a, a sort of a corollary to that question is, did you not lose rotations in this? I think the math works out six courses, six weeks, uh, three rotations times two. Uh, but is that how you did not lose rotations? Yes, yeah. So the three weeks that, that, that we wound up, that six weeks sort of coincided with, that looked like the amount of distance learning time we would need. And so that was a consideration mm -hmm. too. We were looking at, okay, we have uh, six weeks, so how do you want to divide that up? You know, maybe we could have done three and three right. or something, but that might have cost us the planning week. So having knowing we had six weeks to plan for has helped a lot. That's great. Um, I'm thinking too about uh, sort of things that you had to give yourself permission to do uh, and things you had to give yourself permission to, to give up um, and a little bit of that uh, probably gets to the question of pushback to combine mm. <laughs> two of our yeah. questions and get at some of the ones that are uh, coming in the chat as well. Great question. I mean, I, one of the, you know, one of the big things was um, just the idea of the planning week. That was a little bit of a hard sell, uh, which when we explained it as, as we did, the group that worked on this, it makes a lot of sense. And everyone, all of our different constituencies bought into that. Um, but so letting go of this idea that all six classes have to meet every single day, uh, that was the first big thing where we really changed our mindset on that and said, it's okay if we, if we step away from that a little bit. 
I think um, the asynchronous work, the asynchronous element has been the most exciting part of this, certainly, but also the most um, challenging part of this because it's something we've never done before. Our students or our teachers and our parents have never seen it before either. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety, which I completely understand. There's a lot of anxiety and hand wringing about what if students don't you know, do the asynchronous work um, exactly on the pace that we want them to do. As teachers, I think it's like in our personality, it's in our DNA, you know, we, we want the students to do like, well, on Monday you do a little bit and then on Tuesday you do a little bit and then on Wednesday you do a little bit. And so seeing students who are, um, you know, maybe waiting like until Wednesday or Thursday to get started or something like that uh, will cause a lot of anxiety with teachers, including me, and that's something I've had to learn to let go of a little bit that, you know, student, you do kind of give the students a little bit more autonomy. The students now have a little bit more control over their learning. They're a little bit more independent um, than they are when they're physically with us on campus. And for us as teachers, that's a little bit scary because, you know, we're giving them a little more room potentially to fail. I don't think they will. We have a, a lot of supports in place, including a great advising program here. Um, but teachers are, especially in an asynchronous week, giving up a little bit of the amount of control they have over sort of um, scripting exactly what their students do sort of day in and, and day out. So uh, that's, that's probably been the biggest challenge for us to address and something for us to let go of is our desire to really control exactly what's happening every single day. So I that's think... Really Go ahead, Sarah. Yep. No, I was just gonna say, you pointed out too that students will show up sometimes for a synchronous class who, from whom we are having trouble getting assignments in other ways. But being in the Zoom doesn't necessarily mean, I mean, how many conferences are we all going to now or webinars? Somebody's got this right. playing in the background right <laughs> now while they do three other things, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> and so, you know, mere presence behind the, the webcam is not necessarily ensuring active learning. Right, right, and, right. Yeah, that whole idea that, okay, well, if they're not really engaging with asynchronous, would a synchronous week have, it, you know, really improved the learning quality for that student? And I, I don't think the answer is yes to that. I think what we've done so far and what's going really well and what I'd, what I'd recommend is something that, you know, we've sort of modeled on um, off of what one schoolhouse does, which is if you notice a student is not in, as engaged with the class as you think uh, they should be or need to be, you know, reaching out obviously to that student, but also involving parents, making sure that the parents are aware, uh, making sure that the student's advisor uh, is aware. And that's been a big help to us. Our advisors are meeting with their advising groups, um, both one-on-one -on -one and as groups, those, those are built into our schedule too. And so if the advisor knows, hey, you haven't you know, done assignment two and it's Thursday for your English class, like what's going on? Let's talk about that. That goes a long way in helping with that engagement in the asynchronous courses. I think maybe there was this fear with asynchronous that teachers just kind of put it out there and then wait until the end of the week and see what happens. But what we're finding and what works well is that teachers are very much teaching during the asynchronous period. Uh, it's, it just looks very different. You know, they're giving feedback, they're, they're making comments, they're uploading videos. They're just not meeting everybody at the same time on Zoom for 45 minutes. That's a great point. When students are growing and learning in response to something created by their teacher and then having interaction and feedback with teachers, that's teaching, whether it looks like something we're used to looking at or not. Um, so pushback. And, you know, how are the different constituent groups? How are you responding to different groups in terms of pushback or reservations? Yeah, so far, um, so far, we haven't had too much. I think the, the, the first area of pushback was, you know, is this going to be as rigorous an academic program as um, uh, what they get when they're in person? And, and the answer is yes, the class time is the same, the instructional time is the same, the learning goals are the same. Um, so, so not, we, we addressed that pushback pretty well, I think, and, and haven't had to deal with much at all. You know, I think we were lucky in that our spring distance learning went, all things considered, went well. And um, especially relative to everything else that was going on in the world of education. 
And so we, I think, developed a lot of trust with our families, uh, with our parents, especially our, our returning families. They really trusted us a lot. You know, they said, okay, well, you managed last spring and relative to, you know, my, my younger kids or, you know, my neighbor's kids, what you all did was pretty good. So even though you're changing things and now you've got this asynchronous, which we don't really know what that means, we trust that it is, you know, something that will work well for, for our students. Um, so that, that trust was really instrumental. I think this would have been really hard to do um, if, if we did, had not built up that trust from last spring. So, Pete, how, how are you guys ev evaluating this program uh, right now? And are there elements of it that you see as possibly being useful uh, going forward, even when we're all back on campuses together at some point? Yeah, that's a great question. We, uh, we're we evaluating it just by sort of looking at one, um, sort of are the, at the most basic level, thing goals, do we feel like they're being met? Even in ways, even if the assessment looks different, even if the class period is a little bit different, are the learning goals being met and are students engaged? And do students feel like it's meaningful work? We, the same way we did last spring, we will certainly survey all of our constituencies, you know, our, our teachers, our parents, our current students, and I'm, I'm excited to find out what we learn from that. Uh, I anticipate, one of the areas I anticipate really might develop into a thing would be, does distance learning look different in like grade nine or 10 than it does in grade 10 or 12. Mm. That's something that just, you know, we didn't have the time to explore or get much into, but I, I wonder if survey results will bear that out, that certain students had, had a better experience with it than others, and maybe that breaks down by grade level. And then if we ever do something like this again, or offer something like this again, um, do we vary it by now all of our students, grades nine through 12, are more or less on the same plan, the same structure. Thank you. I think um, some of the international research that shows that American teachers have fewer hours of professional time built into their school day and, and what the impact of that is, that's something that may very well become, you know, not in this form, but maybe in this form, you know, something that going forward keeps on. We've got a couple of really nitty gritty questions in the Q&A, so I'm going to ask those next. One is, um, how long are your synchronous classes? Uh, our synchronous classes are 45 minutes, which is a little bit shorter. Uh, we do, I think, 54 minutes when, um, 50 minutes, 52 minutes when students are here physically. Um, so we shorten them just a little bit, but 45 minutes long are the synchronous classes. Okay. And then we've also got the question, do students who take multiple classes in the same discipline, so if you have a student who is more advanced in one area, it is maybe taking two mm. humanities courses or two science courses. So is that a challenge or is that just kind of woven in? Uh, we were able to really minimize that, that challenge. That was an obstacle, but what we did was we have, so like this week in the morning, there are sort of three synchronous blocks, I think like 10 a.m., 10.50 a.m., um, you know, and 11.45 or something like that. And um, we were able to schedule it so that if a student is in, let's say, physics and anatomy at the same time, you know, the physics is in one of those synchronous blocks and the anatomy is in a different synchronous block um, and minimize some of those schedule conflicts. Pete, I've got a question, and I'm following up a, another question from a, another boarding school person, uh, and I, I answered it, but I realized that I might not have given a complete answer. Uh, the question has to do with the other functions of school, um, you know, residential life, uh, athletics, clubs, activities of that sort. Is there time built in for those Kind of community and and group activities to carry forward in, during this period? Yeah, that's a great question too. Uh, I'm happy to talk about. So we, um, it, one of the dilemmas we faced was to what extent do we try to recreate everything we do here on campus and try to recreate that in an online space when we have to go to distance learning? Some of the feedback we got from last spring was that we just tried to do way too much 
Um, like we had our sports teams meeting on Zoom. <laughs> uh, we were having, you know, chapel on Zoom. We were having assembly on Zoom. We we're having special assemblies on Zoom. And some of the keep it keep it simple. While we're not doing it to the same degree, have a PE program, like a physical education program in place of winter sports, optional for a student. Provide this if you want to do it. You know, we'd love to, but it's not mandated. Um, I, I could mandate and really say focus on your class, important stuff, keep it simple. That was uh, a key driver of developing this process too. Advising was the piece that we said this is really important. Of all the things we do of teaching, it's that time that students have with their advisor and with their advisory group. So uh, that has a, a very robust presence in our distance learning. Athletics and um, you know chapel assemblies, we've reduced the number of those that we do online. Great. Thank you. We are almost out of time. I want to just um, put in a plug for next week. I've got a little bit about what's coming. And then while I'm prepping that, we have a question about international students. Are any of those students still in your dorms here in the U.S.? Yeah, another really good question. Yes, the answer is yes. We have a few students who have, do have a few students on campus right now just because of travel uh, restrictions or inability to travel, difficulty of traveling. It made more sense for them to stay put. Um, and so they're doing their classes online, but they're in their dorm room. And for us, that's nothing too unusual. Uh, so those of us who do dorm duty and things like that, we're still doing that, but to a much lesser degree uh, 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 doing less duty, but to supervise um, the students who had, the few students who have remained here at school. Great. I just Thanks. wanna thank you again, Pete, for um, sharing your schedules with us. And we're hoping that you'll come back and tell us, you know, this is sort of the, here's what we're doing. And we would love to have you in a couple of minutes say, hey, here's how it went. <laughs> you know, Absolutely, I'll be happy to. I hear a part two. <laughs> yeah, sounds good yeah. to me. Um, Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It was it was really I'm really happy to, to share some of this. I hope people found it useful. And if anyone out there wants to talk more, just send me an email um, and I'm happy to answer any questions or follow up with with anyone who's interested. Great. Thank, thank you. you so much. Pete. So next week we are doing, I think, a related topic, which is reflective leadership. And so I look forward to having some of you back here for that. And then on our website now, you can find our upcoming professional development after the winter break. Um, after the winter break and a few weeks into January, like Pete, we feel like people are gonna need January to, to regroup a little bit. So love to have you join us for any of that. And again, thank you, Pete.